It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Hello, everybody. This is John Bornstein. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley right here in Colorado Springs, and I'm so delighted that you are tuning in today to our program, Engage in Truth. We're back in the book of Philippians. We are trying to wrap up Philippians chapter 2 today. In fact, what you often hear if you've been listening to this program for a while are 25-minute condensed versions of what we study week in and out at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley. I have the opportunity to teach in an expository style in which we go through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so that you can understand the handbook that God has given to us. He gives 66 chapters, over 750,000 words. Our heart and goal is to go through all of that so that you have a thorough understanding and knowledge of the handbook that God has given to us and how to live in accordance to his will and how to be productive with the time that he's given to us in the short period of time that we have in order to make an impression and impact in our spheres of influence. So I want to thank you for tuning in today and investing in your knowledge and understanding of the word of God. So here we are in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. In the short time that we have today, I'm going to try to just uh, summarize some of these for you, but I'm also going to read the text. And so if you have your scriptures with you, you can follow along. I often read from the New King James Version. Now, I want to challenge you a little bit. Last week, we were talking about, it was a message that I had titled, Work Out our salvation, working it out, and use some analogies of physical fitness like Paul does. He would he uses from time to time analogies about running the race, about boxing and you know finishing to win the prize and imperishable wreath. So he uses a lot of sports analogies. And so I did a little bit of that last week and the irony in it is that right after giving that message, I was driving down the road, pulled into a parking lot at a grocery store with my daughter. We were talking about some things from the message and you know, I'll, I'll drive through the parking lot. Not very long, though. I'm pretty impatient. I'll just find one of the outer spots, park there. I'm okay walking to the front door, do my grocery shopping, get out of the place and get out of everybody's way. But this particular day, I found one of those spots that was right up front. Very odd, unusual for me. So I took that spot. It was about one spot removed from the front door. So I thought, boy, this is a, this is a pretty special moment. I got a front parking spot here. So I pulled in there and there were no other cars cars around me. So there's like three empty spots right up front. So I go in, I go grocery shopping, come out. And sure enough, wouldn't you know it, there are cars all around mine, as you would expect. But the interesting thing was, is the car to my right had given ample space for people to be able to get in and out of their vehicles. The car directly to my left, however, had, well, it was one of those oversized vehicles that had somehow managed to squeeze in between the other cars. In fact, you probably could have used like a butter knife to squeeze these automobiles in together. I don't even know how they opened their door. I, in fact, I had to go through the other side of the car in order just to be able to get into my driver's seat to be able to pull my automobile out. The interesting thing is that I see in doing this is as I'm backing my vehicle out, there I notice the bumper stickers on the back back of the car that has squeezed into this parking spot, the bumper sticker reads, I run, therefore I am. Well, you can imagine the irony and some of the laughter that came to my mind in that moment because I'm thinking, you run, therefore you are? Well, apparently not very far. I mean, if you're willing to squeeze into that little tiny spot, you don't want to move very far. You know, so just a little bit of uh, humor in that because then I saw another car driving down the road. In fact, they were behind me and I was driving along and this car's coming right up behind me and it comes right up to my bumper, starts swerving a little bit and I get an impatient. Then I hear a horn. And just as the road splits into two, the car whips around me, squeezes in front of me, uh, behind the car then that was in front of me, and starts doing the same thing. We all come to the stoplight, I come up close to the car, and there behind it was bumper stickers that read, Pro-Life and Life Matters. 
I'm thinking here are two perfect instances of individuals who are willing to put stickers on their car but not apply what the stickers say. Obviously, if life mattered, you better not be in front of that person because life clearly didn't matter if you were in their way. So the moral of this story is if you're not going to apply the things that we're talking about on this broadcast, you may want to wait before putting the stickers on your car. See, as ambassadors for the living Lord, we're then expected to model the things that we're being taught to be salt and light into the culture, to live it out, not just hear it, not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And we dare not be filled with hypocrisy to where we hear these things, people hear them come out of our lips, but our actions say the opposite. So these are why we're going through the word as we are. These instances, we see it all around us. People seem to say the right things and not do the right thing. So I want to challenge you today as we're going through Philippians chapter 2 and wrapping up the chapter. That what you hear today, I hope encourages you. I hope fills your mind with all sorts of new ideas and encouragement and passion to go out and do the right things. Now, today's message I have titled five characteristics of a godly man. Now, I'm not trying to alienate all of our female listeners out there. This is for you too. Uh, But I do want to call attention to you men who are listening right now that I believe that you will be challenged by what Paul has to share with us today. Because in Philippians chapter 2, these latter verses of 19 to 30, he is calling attention to two specific men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And this is unusual for Paul because usually he'll wrap up a letter giving greetings and at at the beginning of the letter and then giving encouragement and calling out certain individuals towards the end of his letter, not right in the middle of the book. So we are here. We are right in the middle of the book and he's calling attention to these two individuals. Now, five characteristics of a godly man would suggest that these individuals were men who had come from the pedigree of circumstances. And what we'll see is that they didn't. In fact, we don't know anything about their father figures. And that's the irony in this, that Paul uses these two men as models examples challenging us with the characteristics of a godly man, though these men came from what seems to be perhaps a broken home in which we don't know anything about these father figures. They may have been individuals who were absentee fathers. Maybe they passed away. We just don't know. Uh, But we do know is for Timothy that his mother and grandmother are singled out, but we know nothing about his father figure. So no matter what you're coming from, no matter what circumstances your life has taken you down, whatever path you have ventured across and down and that journey and so forth, whatever's happened in your life, Uh, God can use you. God's grace is sufficient. You can't be in such a hole that God cannot find you. God is merciful, gracious. He calls us and he equips us to do his work. So no matter what trials you've been through, God can still use you for his glory. And so today's message, I want to really challenge men to become manly men in the faith. And and when I'm talking about manly men, I'm not talking about those guys who, you know, like what the culture says, you know, you say those words, manly men together, suddenly we get these impressions in our mind of the guy who's out there hunting and fishing and uh, having a barbecue and he's working on his car, he's sporting chest hair, maybe he shaves with a chainsaw, he's wrestling alligators all while he's watching professional football all at the same time. That's not the manly man that I'm talking about here today. I'm talking about Men who are fully invested, cause-centric for the work of Jesus Christ, for living the life, modeling the life, invested in the cause, and caretakers of their home. That truly is a manly man. I'm talking about the Joshuas who had boldly declared that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about Caleb at 85 years old who never stopped charging the mountains for the glory of God? How about Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah? We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would stand boldly for God in the face of a king who would raise up a statue unto himself. These are these are manly men, men of the scripture who leave us great examples to follow, of men who stood for a cause. Now, the reason why I want to call out men today, because men have a very vital role in the home, and you probably knew that, but when they own the responsibilities as God has given to them, a Amazing things happen when men become men of prayer, men of responsibility, who are in the word and spiritual leaders of their home. It is amazing what can happen. And I believe this is why the enemy works overtime to squelch 
what men should be within the home. The, the image that we see on television shows and all across our culture are men who are almost worthless in the home. That is not the way God calls men to be, nor defines men to be throughout the scripture. Did you know that if a child, for example, comes to know the Lord in the home, say the child is the first one in the home to come to know the Lord, there's a three and a half percent probability that other members of the household will follow. If the mother is the first one to become a Christian, there's a 17% probability that everyone else in the household will follow. But if the father is the first to become a believer, or if the father is, for example, a devout leader of faith within the home, there's a 93% probability that the other members of the family will come to know the Lord as their Savior. No wonder the enemy wants to take men down in our culture and, and you know, saturate them with addictions, addictions to work, addictions to status. They get their identity often by what they own and what they do, seeking respect from the culture. And these things become quite a distraction from their time invested in the things of God. And in fact, what we're seeing is this gender gap in American churches. 61% of women make up the congregation. 61% are women. 39% of congregations are men. So of about 94 million men in the United States, 68 million aren't attending church. But 85% of those men will say that they did grow up in some sort of church background, but yet they're having a failure of connecting within the church. They have no vision, no cause-centric drive that sends them out boldly into the culture for Jesus Christ. Luke 8.3 says that there were many women who supported Jesus and his disciples during their ministry. In fact, in Matthew 25, or excuse me, 27, verses, verse 55, it says that many women were there. Watching from a distance, they had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Then in Luke 24, 22, we see a group of women who are the first to find the empty tomb. It's interesting how we see that women tend to gravitate to the things of God, to Jesus Christ our Lord, but men seem to struggle in connecting within the church. And yet in the scripture, what we find is there are 205 named women in the scripture, 600 unnamed And of men, there are 1,386 named men in the scripture of 3,200 individuals in the Bible. So there's seven times more named men in the scripture than women. So men, we have ample examples of what it means to be a spiritual warrior in our culture. But yet in this culture, we have this individualistic concept of destiny that we have to embrace this rugged individualism, like we're supposed to be Nimrod or some sort of Superman or Batman character that I can do everything on my own. I don't need anybody else, and I am strong and powerful all by myself. When the scripture clearly indicates that where two or more are gathered together in in my name, there he is in our midst, and I believe this is where mountains can move in our culture. You know, the Great Awakening comes to mind. It was in 1857. This is about the Third Great Awakening. You know, men were out of work, drunkenness was rampant, all sorts of trial and tribulation in the culture. You wouldn't think of 1857 being like that, but it was. And one man had a burden. He was a 48-year-old businessman. His name is Jeremiah Lamphier. He had a burden for his culture, so he started a prayer movement right there in Manhattan. It was called the Fulton Street Revival because of what happened. Here he is, a man who starts to pray. Another man joins him. Another man joins the next week and it continues to grow until tens of thousands of men started meeting throughout the week to pray. It was a revival in the act of pure worship and Sunday services were no longer the focal point because God was solely the focal point. And a whole revival breaks out where they say over a million people would come to know the Lord as a result of the faithfulness of one man who would make God the priority in his life. So here we're giving this example now of manly men. And I'll tell you, manly men are critical to ministry. So let's read. He says in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, 
He wa- he's encouraged. He, he wants to be encouraged. He's so concerned for the well-being of the church. He wants to send the best guy for the job. In fact, the word encouraged there, we only see here in the New Testament. And it's a word that's called yup suk eo. Yup suk eo. It's a very unique Greek word. And it only a- appears really here because it was something that was often on graves. Stones. Often it was a word for condolences, this idea that it may be well with our soul. It was sort of this, this idea of squelching all cynical behavior, all critical or pessimistic behavior. It was a word that really gets to the heart that he is concerned and he wants the well-being for them and he's optimistic at the same time that I'm sending the best guy who's what he says in the next verse, verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. So he's adding this adverb in here of genuinely or sincerely caring for the state of the church. And you got to wonder then, how many of us really care for the state of the church like that? I mean, here Paul is sending Timothy because not only is he concerned, I mean, sincerely concerned, but he's sending out his best guy who, this is what he goes on to say, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. The word there is dokime, which is proven worth. It's it's this idea that Timothy has been laboring alongside Paul now for more than 10 years. He's been tested in his character. He's been refined and purified, kind of like removing the impurities from metal when you're trying to find the pure metal state like gold, when you have to refine it through fire. That's the word he's using there to describe Timothy. He hasn't given up. He hasn't given in for 10 years. He's labored at my side and I'm sending you the best because I have a sincere concern for you, my church, God's church. I, I think of it like a, a standpoint of, well, people are kind of like tea bags. You never know how strong they are, are until you drop them in hot water, right? I mean, I mean, you never know how strong tea is. You don't really know what it tastes like until you put it in hot water. Our character will come out when we're put through the hot water, the hot things of life, when our character is tested, when who we are is tested. That That's when our true colors show. And, and this is what he's talking about with Timothy. He's the real deal. He has served me well. He's truly a doulos. That's really the word that's used there, a duleo, someone who's slaving away for the cause of Christ, not because it's a chore, but because it's an honor. So here he's using Timothy to give us this example of someone who's given the time, he's put in the discipline, he's been proven and tested, and now he's ready for service. And what comes to mind then is T plus D equals G. Time plus discipline equals growth. Now, it's the truth that I'm telling you here that nothing worthwhile can be conquered in one evening. I mean, nothing of any value is something that you attain quickly. You've seen that TV show, Extreme Home Makeover, where in a week they build a house from nothing. I mean, they take an old beat up home, they rip it all down, all the way through to the foundation. They pour a new foundation, they build a house, they completely build a big and beautiful home in a week. It's amazing. But I'll tell you, if they tried to even do it in one day, it couldn't be done because concrete won't cure fast enough to hold the foundation in place for the home that they'd want to build on it. It can't be done. It's not physically possible in the law of physics. So what we have to understand is that even in any rushed environment like that, there's still a requirement of time to test it, to cure it, to make it strong enough to endure. Now, this is part of what we call mature in the faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And then he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that basically this is a process of being changed. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is in the spirit. And then he goes on to say in verse 23 to 24, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust the Lord that I myself 
shall also come shortly. Now, he is longing to get back in the church. He cares for the church. He wants to be with his people. You know, it's been said, if absence makes the heart grow fonder, some people must really love the church. (laughs) You know where I'm going with that. We got to be invested. If Paul cared about it to be in it that much, he's seeking it out because he's in prison during this time for his faith. He wants to be with his people. Do we have that same desire to be with God's people? Remember, we can be a spiritual thermostat even in our home, not just a thermometer that picks up the temperature of the spiritual attributes within our home or aspects within the culture of our home, but a thermostat that it can actually adjust the temperature in our home. We're told in Proverbs 22, 6 that we're to train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's planting seeds with intentionality. Now, coming back to Timothy for a moment. Remember I said all we hear about is his mom and his godly grandmother Lois. So his mom Eunice and his godly grandmother Lois. These are the two individuals we hear are influential in his life. Second Timothy 1, 3 to 5. And now he moves into this other individual whom he gives a lot of, of, information about him and an amazing endorsement about. So Timothy, we get over 24 mentions of Timothy. In fact, his name means to honor God. And then alongside Timothy is this other relatively unknown person, Epaphroditus. His name means belonging to Aphrodite. Now, no believing family would have named their son that. So obviously he came out of an unbelieving family, a pagan background, and yet God uses these two men, individuals who probably came from broken homes, and God is sending them out into ministry to become the manly men that God intended them to be, men who have his characteristics. So let's get into those. These are the five characteristics that I pick up as Paul describes Epaphroditus in verse 25. He says, yet I consider I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, who's a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, your messenger, and one who ministered to my needs. Did you pick that up? Number one, a brother. He's a brother, which connotates this uh, this intimacy, a friendship, an Adelpho. See, he's like a Philadelphia bro- city of brotherly love, right? A philia, which is that type of love, a brotherly love. Here's what it says in Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Outdo yourselves in honoring one another. How about Hebrews 13, 1? Keep on loving one another as brothers, Number two, he was a fellow worker, a sun ergos, a sun ergos. He was working the kingdom work. He cared about doing the chores in the church. He cared about doing the work in the home. Nothing is beneath them. They're a servant-minded first, a doulos mentality. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Then number three, he calls him a fellow soldier, a sustrat iotes, a fellow soldier, that we are brothers, we are co-laborers together, workers, and we are fellow soldiers in the faith, as Ephesians 6 says, to equip us up for the work, that to armor us. We get Ephesians 4, equipping the saints, Ephesians 6, armoring us together for warfare. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14, it says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. And then he says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, join with me in suffering like a good soldier for Christ Jesus. We are good soldiers for Christ Jesus indeed. And then he calls him a messenger, an apostolos, not an apostle, but the attributes of one who gives the message, who's going boldly, who's delivering what needs to be said. In fact, he says this again in 2 Corinthians 5.20, that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, Be reconciled to God. You are a messenger for Christ, Christ's ambassador. Then finally, he calls him a minister, a litiergos, which is a minister of the gospel, one who is ministering to the needs of others, who is serving unconditionally. Your ministry begins at home. Let me challenge you with this. Men often struggle with investing their time in a spiritual way, those prayers at the dinner table, 
devotions with your spouse, being a spiritual thermostat in your home. It's kind of like that old adage, a penny saved is a penny earned. Did you know that for every penny that's increased at the gas pump, the companies will profit $200 million for one penny invested? In 2009, the Leukemia Society did a penny march and they collected 15 billion pennies that's 150 million dollars the world record was a gentleman who was a manager at ed's service station in 2005 he brings in all his pennies he has 1.3 million pennies that totaled 13 thousand dollars see men 93 percent of women surveyed by the life Way Research Group said they wanted men to become the spiritual leaders of the home. If you can invest a little of your time here, a little of your time there, they are pennies saved, which is pennies earned in a spiritual manner. The time you spend with your children, Harvard said that the honor roll students, one of the distinguishing factors is they had dinner with their family four nights a week. That made a huge difference between a non-honor roll student and an honor roll student. University of Florida and the University of Georgia conducted a study and said that indeed 81% of couples who prayed together indeed stayed together. Imagine that, a penny invested in a spiritual way. A little bit of time here, a little bit of time there made a huge difference in the culture of their home. So I want to challenge you, become a manly man in the faith. Lead your family in the spiritual ways of God and watch him work through the culture of your home I hope you were encouraged today. We're just getting started. Philippians chapter 3 next week, so tune in. To learn more about our ministry, go to calvaryfountain.com. Again, it's calvaryfountain.com. Our services are at 10 a.m. I'd love to see you there. God bless.